morning, everyone. Would you join with me in the spirit of prayer? Gracious God, be with us and love us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I want to thank all of you, and I particularly want to thank Mark for having me come to Central Endicott to share today. Um, Mark's been a friend for a number of years, and my family, who's seated right behind the choir here, um, have a great connection to this area. My wife actually grew up up in Morris, New York, and um, before the merger of the conferences, let's say that the Southern Tier and Northeast PA were very much our home, and uh, it feels very, very good to be back here. I'm, I'm so grateful to Mark, who's been a friend for for quite a while. Um, I remember lining up with him in ordination, one of those years that they made us line up in order of being first ordained, and he was like right in front of me. Um, and it was in that conversation of, well, this is when you were ordained first as a deacon that, that we found out that we were both in seminary in Atlanta together. Two different seminaries, but we were both in seminary in Atlanta together. So. Mark and I have been close to each other sometimes without even knowing it. It's the way life works. Um, I'm so glad that you would have me come and talk about something that's really a passion to my heart and is what I believe one of those talentas that we just heard about. You heard that word as talent. Um, you know, and we think about talents as somebody who can juggle you know, or do mime, or card tricks, or swallow a sword. A talanta, as we're going to find out in a little bit, isn't really that. A talent, as it's, transfer, as it's translated in our gospel lesson today, is really a form of money. But we'll talk about that as we move through the gospel lesson today. I want to first talk about Africa University, but I want us to be geographically on the same page. And I don't mean necessarily where but I mean how. Here's a picture of our world as we typically see it. And if you notice, you know, I mean, Africa's a large continent right here, but the United States isn't that much smaller, you know. Until we look at the relative sizes as appropriate, this is a projection of the world that we typically see, but this is the world as it really is. If you notice, Africa is much larger than, than our North American continent. And in fact, if we compare the size of Africa with the other continents in our world, we notice a few things. We can take all of China, Mexico, Western Europe, India, Portugal, and Spain, and the United States, and Japan, and they will all fit on the African continent. Were you aware that Africa was that big? Africa is a huge continent, full of resources, spiritual resources, physical resources, natural resources that our world desperately needs. This is a continent that's very much a part of our planet. And it is so large. When, when, when I first saw this, it, it kind of blew my mind. And I had been to Zimbabwe. I knew that we had to, on this, on this huge intercontinental jetliner, we had to stop in Angola to refuel to get to Zimbabwe. That's how far Zimbabwe was from Portugal, where, where we had left from. So it's a large continent. Can we all agree on that? Great. Um, this is the 50-some countries that make up Africa. And I just want you to see where African University is. Whoop. There we go. Um, it's down here in the sub-Saharan country of Zimbabwe. And here's a map of Zimbabwe. Um, our original United Methodist outreach in what was the country of Rhodesia, now the country of Zimbabwe, was at Old Mutare in the late 1800s. Old Mutare is about right there, right about where the E is. On this map, the word mutare, you can see where the dot is. Um, the reason that they moved from old mutare 
to what is now the city of Mutare right there is because of the mountains. They couldn't get the railroad across the mountains appropriately. So they decided to set up a different city, which is current day Mutare. But the old Mutare Methodist mission is still there. And right across the road from there sits proudly Africa University. Now, Africa University is your university. You helped to build it. What I like to do when I teach a confirmation class is to remind confirmands that when they join the United Methodist Church, every brick that's in every United Methodist Church around the world is partially theirs. Because we are all together as a community of faith, part of each other. Africa University, as the first slide said that was up for the whole service, is a United Methodist institution. It is your institution. It is our institution around the world as United Methodists. Africa University was formed by the General Conference in 1988. That's one reason it is our institution. We formed it. It is run by those who live and work in Zimbabwe, but it is a United Methodist institution. And so it has a field office, if you will, in Nashville, Tennessee. And that's the Africa University Development Office. It opened for classes in 1992. This is when I got to see Africa University. It was um, not very big at that point. It wasn't very large. There wasn't a whole lot to see because they started, as we'll see in a moment, with just a few students. But it grew. It's based on a British model of higher education. What that means is when you apply to the university, you don't apply to the university. One of our students wants to go to uh, Binghamton University. They apply to SUNY or the University of Binghamton. At Africa University, you have to apply to the faculty. And the faculty must accept you as a member of their student body. So you apply to the faculty, and they approve you. So if you're going to study English, you apply to the English faculty. If you're going to study management and business, you apply to the management and business faculty. And they must accept you. They must accept your high school work, and they must accept um, you as a student to work with. All the buildings are debt free. One of the great miracles of Africa University is, is that they don't start a building until they have all the money in the bank to pay for the building totally. Africa University is a debt-free university. Now, let me just pause and put a caveat on that. They have taken a small loan through the School of Management and Business as a means by which to buy goods and to recreate a marketing strategy so that their students can learn. So is there any outstanding debt to Africa University? Yes. It's a very, very small incremental debt that will be paid back as that business model is lived out by those students attempting to understand management of business in our world. The slogan for AU, and I want you to hang on to this, is learn here, live here, lead here, meaning in Africa. There is kind of an understanding out there, and this is one reason for the new slogan, that many people who study at Africa University are attempting to get to the United States so they can live lives here and have really great lives here after graduating from AU. That's not the mission of Africa University. The mission is to bring up leaders for Africa. And we're going to talk about, in just a few minutes, how that happens in a very powerful and unique way, and one that I think really, really embodies what our church's leadership in the world is really called to be about. AU makes a difference, and these are just the different schools that are there. Agricultural and natural resources, health sciences, theology, education, humanities and social sciences, Institute of Peace, Leadership, and Governance, the only university in the world that has one of those. Just think about that name, Institute of Peace, Leadership, and Governance. 
to teach peace leadership is something that AU and the African continent, I believe, can lead the whole world in learning about. And the School of Management and Administration, that is the business school. What's Africa University doing? Well, 4,000 students are working all around the continent of Africa on all of those different areas we just spoke about. Did anyone here hear the stories back not too long ago about the childhood warriors? Eight to 12 year olds who had been um, uh, recruited by warlords to be soldier, soldiers, child soldiers. I mean, it blows my mind away to think about. Fairfield Buddies is a program set up through Africa University students to help those children put down weapons and reform their lives and begin to have a life where they can actually live in the world and grow and have normal life. In many ways, these childhood warriors have in some instances been scarred for life this is a means for them to find some meaningful ways to get beyond that because of the work of Africa University. The agricultural faculty, and we, you know, think about something as basic as hunger. To develop nutritious and sustainable crops for Africa. One of the thoughts when Africa University was first coming together is, well, won't they just, you know, take some of the mine trust of the US agriculturally and send it over to Africa. And that idea was abandoned for good reason. Because there are many people in Africa who understand the agriculture, understand the weather systems, understand what's needed to make life there appropriate. And that's what I think the really great thing about Africa University is, because you've got people that understand the environment, understand what's needed to grow good crops, to feed the people of Africa, and perhaps beyond. What's Africa University doing? This business project I spoke about was engaging women's groups and farmers in basic business skills. Now, we would think, well, what's so spectacular about that? Um, and the youth asked me about this, and we'll see it in a, in a slide coming up. 48% of the Afri uh, Africa University student body is female. In Africa, that's a big deal. Africa University sees one of its mission to empower women in Africa. Again, because of what life has been not only in Africa, but in many parts of the world, where sexism has held women back from leading, from caring, and from doing what they can do to support themselves. In, in health, basic initiatives. Med lab tech, supporting in HIV and AIDS. What's Africa University doing? Church growth and development. The church in Africa grows unbelievably fast. And there's a need to develop the church appropriately. I remember when I preached there in 92, I only had 3,000 people show up to that worship service. And this was at a crossroads. There wasn't even a building. There is all, and not that you need a building to be a church, please don't hear that. But there are ways at which the Africa church needs to develop in its own way to grow how it's going to be a valuable part of the church in the world. And that's one of the things that AU leaders are helping to do. Along with developing new congregations in Angola, in the Congo, in Liberia, in Mozambique, and helping in conflict-affected communities. Very, very important. We've all heard of some of the struggles going on in Africa, in the Sudan, between uh, tribal groups. And it is the church that's making a difference by establishing means for people to communicate and to be in communi community together. The Institute of Peace, Leadership, and Governance that I've already mentioned, 
were part of the formation of the newest country in the world. Did you know there was a new country in the world? Only about a year old, called South Sudan. This is the same country that, you know, we've heard all the stuff coming out of Sudan, the problems with Darfur. It is Africa University that has been there through the Institute of Peace, Leadership, and Governance that actually conducted a peace conference to help in the formation of this country and also how it could be led in peaceful means through this world and into the community of nations as part of the UN. So where's it going? The enrollment's already an all-time high. It started with 40 students in March of 1992. It currently is at 1,634 students. That's 42% higher than the previous academic year. 42% higher. So the university continues to grow and continues to educate. And that's a good thing. 23 countries are represented. Zimbabwe is the largest contingent, because that's where the university is located. The Democratic Republic of Congo has 154 students currently. Angola, 104. 48% of the student body is female. That is a turning point for many women in Africa to be able to come and have a university education. That's something to be celebrated and lifted up. And again, that motto, learning here, living here, leading here, that the idea is not to drain the African Brain Trust to the US, but to have those who are part of Africa University continue to lead on the continent of Africa. But I do want to talk about the Bible a little bit. We have this parable that we've looked at. Um, I don't want to tell Mark what to do next week, but Mark, I heard something as it was being read this morning that you need to remember. What, and, and I don't know if you all heard this. One thing that the master says to the two who were able to take the talents and increase them, after he says, well done, good and faithful servant, come and inherit what has been placed before you. It's the same language that's used in the parable of the judgment. I find that to be really interesting. Jesus here is trying to teach us about the kingdom. What's the kingdom going to be like? What's it going to be like? And he says it's going to be like this man who goes on a journey. And he entrusts three servants with what he has. And of course, they're entrusted with one talent, two talents, or five talents. I continue to reflect on that sometimes. Why, didn't, why wasn't it just one, two, three? But no, it's one, two, five. So that's where we are. Now, that got me thinking about what's a talent. Again, it's not juggling. It's not being able to do mime. It's not card tricks. It's a talanta in Greek, which is a form of currency. Now, I, I got to go to England this summer, and some of you, and I was sharing this with the youth, some of you heard back in like 2006, 2007, Zimbabwe went through hyperinflation. I actually held for a little bit this summer a $1 billion dollar Zimbabwean dollar, one billion, a bill that was worth one billion dollars. Now, part of that was the hyperinflation. That would buy a good loaf of bread at one point in their hyperinflation. So don't think of it as a billion dollars. Think of it as a problem with hyperinflation. But this form of currency was worth something. This is a quote from Dr. Carla Work. She said, a talent is worth about 6,000 denarii. Since one denarius is a common laborer's daily wage, a talent would be roughly equivalent to 20 years' wages for the average worker. Five talents, the largest amount entrusted to any servant, is comparable to 100 years' worth of labor, an astronomical amount of money. But what really is a talent? I mean, can you hold one? And it turns out you can. OK? A talent is one of several ancient units of mass. And it was a way 
to measure precious metals. Okay? Now, this is what it is. It's an amphora. Okay? It'd be about this tall and about this wide. And I could hold it if I could pick it up. Therein would be the problem. Because the common, the heavy common talent used in New Testament times was 58.9 kilograms, or 130 pounds. 130 pounds. You couldn't take it on an airline with you unless you paid the extra baggage fee, okay? 130 pounds. Now, what's that work out in terms of money? A standard ingot at Fort Knox, anybody remember that? Okay, a standard ingot at Fort Knox weighed 27.4 pounds and is currently worth about $350,000. That assumes a price of gold of $870 per ounce. Yes, I know it's much higher than that, but I had to decide on something. That's what I decided on. So, that's a standard ingot of gold at Fort Knox. The amount of gold that would fit in that amphora would be $1,768,000. Can we all agree that a talent is a lot of money? Probably more money than we're going to see all at once. It's a treasure. It's a treasure. So, five were taken and invested. The servant makes five more talents. Imagine lifting five of those things and then having ten. An unbelievable, incredible amount of money. Just more money than you know what to do with. More money than you could spend in a lifetime. My goal today is not to you know, necessarily uh, preach about um, anything beyond Africa University, but it makes me wonder when we begin to think about those in our business community that have amassed, and I'm talking about the great corporate leaders who have amassed more money than they will ever be able to spend in 10 lifetimes, and what they're doing with it. The two talents are taken and invested. The servant makes two additional talents. Again, is this a lot of money? Well, it's not as much as the 10 talents, but if anybody offered you $3.4 million, would you take it? Assuming they hadn't won it in the lottery. So, the, of course, we're all good United Methodists, so we never take any lottery money, but would you? But then there's the guy with the one talent. He buries it. Now, you might think that burying the talent is like, whoa, he, he's of course the one that's the outcast. Well, in Jesus' day, this is what you did with your money. You buried it because you didn't want to lose it, because you didn't want to risk it, because if you did, you might not have it anymore. So he took $1.78 million and buried it in the backyard, put it in the mattress, whatever, whatever you want to see. By doing that, it couldn't grow, it can't produce, and it'll stay there until it's dug up. It's not risked. And risk is a very interesting thing. I had one little boy throw up his hand at the first service and said, risk, you know, like the game. Yes, exactly. Now, we think a lot of different things about risk, but one thing we need to know is it's an unknown outcome. Sometimes we think that risk is all negative. It's not. Risk, when money's risk, it can yield a positive result or a negative result. It's just like any other risk. It can have a positive outcome or a negative outcome. Which way is it going to go? If there is no risk, there's no growth. If you bury your money in the backyard, it can't grow because you're not risking it. If there's no risk, there's a sense of safety. It's a false sense of safety, but there's a sense of safety that you'll always have it. But you'll always have it in its original form, and it will not necessarily have been able to grow. The first two servants risk their master's treasure. The third servant does not. So what are the messages of this parable? The ending, the one with the five talents is entrusted with more. The one with the two talents is entrusted with more. 
the servant with the one talent immediately begins to make excuses about how you know, upset that the person would be and how bad his judgment's going to be and that he didn't want to get punished. And so what happens? He gets punished because he doesn't risk. He doesn't risk the fact that, yes, the master might be upset if he doesn't do things just right. Which, which leads me to two things. The first thing is, I often wonder if the guy with the five or the guy with the two had come back and said, you know, I lost one. Would the master have been upset? I don't think so. I think the master still would have celebrated the fact that this person was willing to risk. Because how does the parable end, and we often hear it, well done, good, and faithful servant. Say that with me. Come on, let's wake you up a little bit. Well done, good, and faithful servant. We think sometimes, I think, that this parable could be all about works righteousness. But that I mean, you know, you put in so much work and that gets you to salvation. That's not what this is about. Because these servants are not investing their own money. It's the grace of the church. It's the treasure of God. It is one thing that Africa University is for us, but is so many other things about our life together in Christ. It is the riches of Christ that should be invested, that should be risked. But we're too quick sometimes to want to run to the backyard and bury them. What would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? What would you attempt? You can't fail. What would you attempt? I really think that's one of the things that this parable is about. But you would have to attempt it. You couldn't just bury it in the backyard and have great thoughts about it. You would need to take it and risk it. What would you do? The Africa University Scholarship Endowment Fund of the Upper New York Conference is our ministry. It's our way to participate in that mission, which is Africa University, to help students achieve their academic work for the good of themselves, their community, their nations, for Africa, for the world. Brothers and sisters, I believe that Africa University can lead this world in better ways than it's being led right now. But they need our support. The students need our support. And that's what we can offer to these students. The endowment scholarship can be traced back to all four of the precedent conferences that came together to form the Upper New York, New York Conference. And it was, it was declared our missional cornerstone at the 2011 annual conference, which was the second meeting of the Upper New York Conference. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about tuition because we're funding scholarships and we want to fund full scholarships. So let's talk about tuition in the US just for a minute. I have a daughter who attends a community college, a two-year college. And I can tell you that that's about the average. It's not the most expensive. It's not the least expensive. It's the average, about $2,900 per year. That's without room and board. When we look at a state school, room and board for someone who lives in state, 17,100. Again, you can pay more, you can pay less. That includes room and board. For out-of-state students to come to that public university, again, room and board, 29,000. That's the average. For a private, not-for-profit, four-year college, 38,000 is the average. It's not a talent, not a talenta, but it's a lot of money. Now, Africa University, tuition, room, board, and fees, $5,400 a year. And that's going to be hold steady, we hope, as time goes on. And just so you know that I did get my figures from somewhere. They did not just come out of my head. I did look them up online, OK? College boards provided those numbers. OK, how do the incomes prepare, compare, though? Remember, the most expensive average 
was about $38,000. The average U.S. income, $49,000. The average African income continent-wide is $4,000. Now, that goes from the lowest of the Democratic Republic of Congo at $328 per year income to one of the islands off the side of Africa that has very, very good industry of 23,004 to the median, which is uh, the Ivory Coast, 1,600. Now remember, the Democratic Republic of Congo, 328 a year, that's 154 students at Africa University. So those kids are really working hard. Their families are really dedicated to them going to African University with that type of income. The scholarship endowment will raise enough for at least eight full scholarships if we achieve the goal. What's more with sustained investment, these scholarships covering all tuition, room, board, and fees will cover that in perpetuity as long as the university exists and will hedge inflation, which means it will cover any increases to that $5,400 total. Our goal is an annual conference across 937 churches, which of course, Central Endicott's won, is $1 million. But before you begin the division in your head, because I've done the division a lot, we have a lot of churches out there that have 10, 15, 20 people who could not do that division as easily as we could here, or I can at my home church. So there might be those churches like this one that we would ask to do a bit more. Again, to reiterate, eight scholarships forever in the name of the Upper New York Conference. Everyone can be a part of this. This summer, my church ran a vacation Bible school. It's available to you, too, that celebrates Jesus and Africa University, through which our children raised $154 for Africa University, just the kids. Everyone can have a part of this. Uh, and every gift, I don't care how small, every gift that allows every person to be involved is what really matters. I would ask that all of you choose to be a part of this. That our investment together in this talenta, which is Africa University, to extend it so that everyone can share in it is what we can all do to participate in this mission of the United Methodist Church. What would you attempt to do if you knew you couldn't fail? What would you attempt? We can't fail at we might not achieve the million dollar goal, but we can't fail at this. I hope that you will choose to help. Would you join me in this prayer? Lord Jesus, grant us the grace that we might partner with the students and faculty of Africa University, that in sharing in the support of students, your peace and love might be known to Africa and the world. Help us to give boldly to this scholarship initiative to help this university support the women and men who can change the world. Amen. Thank you for having me today. It's